Happy Friday. Welcome to another episode of Murders, Mysteries, and More. My name is Kaylee. My name is Desi. Be sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell next to the subscribe button to turn on post notifications. Before we get into this case, we always encourage those who have useful information to any unsolved case, please report it to your local police and sheriff department. In case you don't recall, back in 2019, a Facebook event was created for September 17th through 21st, 2019 title, They Can't Stop All of Us. This event was created to storm Area 51. 2,000 people came to the event in Rachel, Nevada. There was a series of concerts that took place at those very gates. One person who attended the events answered, Free the aliens, when asked about what she was doing there. With that being said, today we are going to be exploring Area 51. Is there a life outside of Earth? So a little background information about Area 51 is that November 26, 1954, the director of the CIA, his name is Alan Dulles, and assistant Richard Bissell basically were assigned to a secret program. This secret program had a code name called Aquatone. When this program came out was the start of the Cold War, and the program Aquatone was created because the government wanted to build high altitude aircraft. They were trying to build sp spy planes that could fly over like Russia or whatever, but go undetected. One of the aircraft's names is U-2. Area 51, as we know it, is a place where they do test military aircraft in secrecy. Now, on April 12, 1955, Bissell and Air Force officer Colonel Osmond Ritland, Clarence Johnson, Lockheed Skunk Works Division, Lockheed Test Pilot, and Tony Lever were all, like, a part of the Aquato, and, like, they worked for Area 51. Area 51, location-wise, is about 83 miles from Las Vegas, Nevada obviously in the desert middle of nowhere and the area it is in an area called groom lake and that is exactly where area 51 was born u2 is actually not the star of the show of area 51 but many people believe that the aliens are the biggest secret that area 51 is concealing and they even have certain theories as far as like them building a site of ufo crash and also the theory that the U.S. is wanting to reverse engineer spacecrafts to make better military aircrafts. There was a man, of course, that claims that that was his specific job there, was trying to reverse engineer spacecrafts. That'd be cool but, if that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But on May 12, 1989, Floss reporter George Knapp interviewed an anonymous person, and this anonymous person was referred to as Dennis. Dennis supposedly worked at S4, which for those who don't know, S4 is an outpost near Area 51. Dennis responded to this question after he was asked about what exactly was happening there, and he said, quote unquote, Actually, nine flying saucers, flying discs, that are out there of extraterrestrial origins is what's happening. He apparently did ask if the government made the aircraft. He asked that question to Dennis. Dennis says, know that the government did not make that and that that aircraft in order to replicate it basically nearly impossible because it used a gravity propulsion system that type of system would need an anti-reactor and anti-reactors as far as we know it do not exist dennis later on was like his actual identity came out and his real name is robert bob lazar and he's actually a senior staff physicist that did work at Area 51. Edward Teller, he is the one who recommended Lazar. And if you don't know who Edward Teller is, Edward Teller was the inventor of the thermonuclear bomb. Thing they go boom boom. Yep. But Lazar himself did have sketches of 
the aircraft. He actually even did show his sketches in a TV show about it and describe the aircraft. Lazar, however, did not show his face in the very beginning, and here is his exact explanation why he didn't show his identity in the beginning. He says, quote unquote, I've been threatened with being charged with espionage, espionage spy. I've had my life threatened by them. My wife's life was also threatened by them. I mean, I don't know how else you can go from there, end quote. Imagine, like, being threatened by the government. Kind of scary. Why do you think the government was threatening Lazar and his wife? I mean, obviously they were threatening him because he had information of what was happening at Area 51, considering he was a senior staff physicist. So he was probably a lot more hands-on than most people are at that site. And the fact that he was willing to expose so much about Area 51 at that point, it is technically espionage what he's doing because, I mean, he could be charged with that because that is considered, like, spying and revealing, like, government secrets, of course. Right. So, you know, that's why he was threatening him and his wife because they thought if they threatened his wife and him, then they have no choice but to keep quiet. Yeah, and definitely anyone who's actually even tried to get into, like, Area 51, the government takes it very seriously, and they got the gates and stuff, and nobody's allowed in. I mean, yeah, it's for a reason if you think about it, because yeah. you don't know if somebody is actually an American citizen, and what- They True. could have ties to Russian people or anything like that that they could expose our secrets to, Right, so. and that's, like, the same with, like, other military bases, too. There's always going to be the secret, like, government area. Yes, that's any government or any country. Yeah. I mean, they have their secrets and they have to protect them. But in 2018, Lazar was asked if he would take it all back. And although he says he doesn't know, he thinks it might have been better if he didn't have the experience. But Lazar says, quote unquote, that in the late 80s, the government had recovered alien spacecraft, several of them actually, and the technology in the Nevada desert that they were keeping quiet and analyzing was these alien spacecrafts, and that's a fact, end quote. In 2013, declassified CIA documents said that U-2 aircraft was responsible for the UFO sightings. But Lazar says he saw more than the U-2 aircraft, and he says that uh, he saw the flight crew. But in March of 1989, Lazar walked down S-4 Hall, and apparently he saw a gray alien in an unmarked room. And the alien was next to two men in white lab coats, and the guard told him to keep his head down. Why do you think the government decided to release like that classified document in 2013 saying that the U-2 aircraft was responsible for UFO sightings, even though Lazar says otherwise? So I think why the U.S. went so long for that is like, to begin with, like, the U-2 aircraft, like any type of military aircraft to a normal person is, unless they've seen it, is going to seem kind of scary and it, it might cause some conspiracy theorists to pop up and the government did not want exactly that. And yes, Lazar says that it could be something else, but again, he could also not be telling the truth. And that might also be why the government decided not to come out with that because at the time they knew like Lazar was, you know, questioning and about this aircraft and thinking it was a UFO or whatever. And like, to be honest though, the real definition of UFO is basically an unidentified flying object. So the government, like obviously, just because it's a UFO does not mean that it's automatically aliens. It could be like how the government was saying, it was military aircraft. Why they waited so long because they didn't want people to come up with these crazy delusional theories. Okay, that makes sense though. Now into the kids. So, who are the kids? Apparently, according to people who have worked at Area 51 or whatever, the aliens are referred to as the kids. So, Lazar at this time does say that the technology from like the U2 and the technology there in general was not like any technology he had seen before. Granted, this was in like the 50s, so the technology we have today compared to the 50s 
is a lot different. So if you would show someone an iPhone in the 50s, they would probably think that, what the fuck is it? Sure. So anyway, so one of the technology things he was like, oh, this is crazy, is a hand scanner basically to get secret access to certain brands instead of like a key fob. Later on, this was determined to be a thing called the Identimat, which was declassified, and this was used in the F-17 program. Also, Lazarda say that they did use some interesting fuel for the aircraft. It wasn't like normal fuel that they used before. Lazar says that the people there actually showed him how this fuel worked and the physics of it, which I think is really cool. And apparently, what he says is that they needed to duplicate the reactors for this aircraft without this element called Element 15. So if you don't know what Element 15 is, Element 15 is Muscovium. It is a man-made element. It's super heavy and very unstable. And this element can actually produce its own gravity. Obviously, like this aircraft, the government was trying to make aircraft that could fly in a way never like before and like much faster. 2003, a Russian scientist actually like created that exact element. And then, um, and then it was also replicated at the GSI Helm Helmholtz Center in Germany. August 2013, the government finally decided to claim that indeed Area 51 is an actual government location. It actually exists. It's not fake. And if I remember right, someone found it off of Google Maps. Why do you think the government waited until 2013? to acknowledge the existence of Area 51. I feel like they waited so long just because they wanted to keep it a secret as long as they could. But they knew that eventually they would have to come clean and come forward to the public and all that stuff because, of course, things do happen. Like, people accidentally stumble upon it or Google it or things yeah. happen. So yeah. they just decided to get in front of it and release all that information as far as like, hey, Area 51 exists, what we do as far as what that goes, that's top secret. Right, and it's really neat too because ever since like Google Maps came out, there's so many places that people have actually found through Google Maps. But in 1947, there was or known as the Bizarre UFO Crash in Roswell, which uh, there was lots of UFO sightings, which were over 300 sightings in a short period of time. That's a lot. But on June 14th, approximately June 14th, there was a crash in <laughs> Foster Ranch, which, if you don't know, is a dairy ranch, which is northwest of Roswell, New Mexico. On July 4th, a local rancher, Mac Brazil, covered it. And on July 7th, Brazil sends debris to the local sheriff and his name was George Wilcox. In Wilcox context, the Colonel Butch Blanchard, who was a U.S. Air Force member, and of course Butch, since he was a U.S. Air Force member, worked at the Roswell Army Airfield. And if you don't know what that is, it's the base home to a group that deployed atomic bombs in World War II. Yeah, and the rancher described the wreck as, quote unquote, basically rubber strips, tinfoil, and tough paper and sticks, end quote. Why could the rancher describe the wreck as rubber strips, tinfoil, and tough paper and stick? So I guess- That's some weird debris, you know? Yeah, that is definitely weird. I guess probably the reason um, they described it like that is like, it just didn't look like debris they ever seen before, and that also like, it was probably like a very flimsy light aircraft, and so obviously like, with them describing it, like, paper and sticks is basically like them saying like it's just flimsy aircraft i mean like if it's a ufo why would they make it out of <laughs> such flimsy material and to know? be honest who would make it out of material like that that's what i'm saying like if yeah. you're gonna build a ship you right. won't build it like that flimsy unless you're limited and apparently on someone said it was supposed to be unbreakable like unbreakable my ass so what's interesting about the Roswell crash is that the government has changed parts of the story multiple times, like more than once. The first time the government just said it was a normal weather balloon. So a weather balloon is a balloon equipped with 
apparatus which is sent into the atmosphere sent into the atmosphere to provide information about the current weather condition. The government also put photo proof whenever they released the article. In 1994, the Air Force wrote a report talking about it and they did say that this crash was indeed in fact a government cover-up that this was not about aliens but about the military and the explanation that they gave about the crash was it was used for spy work it was a spy device from the project mega so if you guys don't know about project mega Basically, this group of people invented a bunch of high-tech materials for different balloons and other like equipment that was super lightweight and like we said, the rancher described the debris as lightweight and also ultra strong that had fiber optic cables and fireproof fabrics. So this is why like because this material is not typically used for military aircraft, this is why many people theorize it's from the aliens. Yeah, and Dr. Maurice Ewing of Columbia University, he does talk about how with Project Mugal, they would test this aircraft around different U.S. locations and, and Pacific locations. However, they obviously did not say anything much more than that and the reason why they waited so long apparently to him to say that was a cover-up is they didn't want to give away details to this spy work in 1997 they did report that the alien bodies people were describing as were indeed actually test dummies why do you think the government changed its story from it being just a weather balloon that's going to monitor weather conditions to now it's a spy device for a top secret project? I feel like that could have been possibly some ploy to throw some countries off or even people off because, I mean, like, who's going to really believe that it was a weather balloon? It's so unlikely to believe. So they're just like, yeah, we'll just say some outrageous shit and say it's a spy device and you know if they believe it's cool and if not that's cool too even if they were being truthful about it donald schmidt a ufo researcher said the test dummies and the balloon parachute explanation makes zero sense and he also says that the flying saucer explanation would draw more attention schmidt says quote unquote two hours west of roswell the first atomic bomb was detonated you had ongoing atomic research at los alamos you had all this testing of captured German V-2 rockets at White Sand, and at Roswell, you had the first atomic bomb squadron headquartered, Schmidt says, quote, quote. His other exact words he stated were the thought that they would have intentionally set up any type of publicity as a distraction is crazy. If anything, they needed something that would draw less attention, of course. There is another theory. So there's a book called Area 51, an uncensored history of America's top secret military base. In this book, it does say that it does not believe this was from spies or this was aliens. That this was in fact to induce panic in America. That Joseph Stalin, he's a Soviet member, coordinated all of this. Annie Jacobson, who published the book, did talk to an engineer from Area 51. The engineer says that the Nazi concentration camp doctor, Josef Mengele, created the program. And this next part is going to be a little bit disturbing if this is true. I wouldn't entirely put it past the Soviet Union, in my honest opinion, but it says that the Soviets did experiment on poor little children. They basically made it where like their growth was stunted. Crazy, but again, so who's to say that they wouldn't do shit to children? And then they placed these poor little kids on this flimsy aircraft so they could fly over New Mexico. And this was obviously before 9-11. Obviously, like, after 9-11, it really, like, threatened our national security. And so, like, the government monitors, like, 
aircraft a lot more now than at this time because this time was like 1954 so again I wouldn't pa put it past like how some plane ended up being undetected because the level of security back then is nowhere near to the level of security we have today. Do you think that the Soviet Union did experiment on children to make them appear like aliens then place them on this aircraft to fly over New Mexico in order to cause panic in America. It's very possible they could have experimented on children. I mean, look at them now. They're attacking Ukraine and they're killing innocent people. So really, they're just ruthless and they'll do anything for war. But I feel like, you know, it's more, since this was before 9-11, I feel like it's very plausible that they did this just to cause chaos <laughs> amongst America just because we were in a cold war with them once they were really trying to take us out and beat us so i wouldn't post it, put it past the soviet union to do anything to get one over up on us whether it their, their tactic was to take us out or to cause chaos who really knows but they definitely are more likely to do it yeah i definitely agree but according to the book Area 51, an uncensored history of America's top secret military base, the plan was for the children to climb out and be mistaken for visitors from Mars. Panic would ensue and America's early warning radar system would be overwhelmed with sightings of other quote-unquote UFOs. This theory is described by Jesse Marshall that that quote might be exactly what explains the wreckage. But in Marshall's, Marshall Jr.'s book, the Roswell Legacy describes that his father brought UFO wreckage home and let the son play with it. And this was before he took the debris to Air Force Base to be examined. Do we really believe that these books are, you know, like fiction? Or are they, or could they be actually real, like based on real life events? Well, I mean, the people who did end up like writing the books were actually, like both of them, like the one that Annie wrote and then obviously the one that Marcel wrote. Like, they wrote this during, like, the Roswell events, and they did talk to a lot of people who they knew were, like, there at the time, so it is pretty credible. Whatever the people have, like, whatever witnesses have said, we weren't there, so gay witnesses could just be exaggerating, and stuff may have not actually happened. But the actual authors are just writing from what they've heard from, like, actual, like, the actual witnesses. And, like, I think especially the, whenever they talk about the Soviet Union's plan for the children to climb out and be mistaken as aliens from Mars and cause panic in America and that the U.S. would have more UFO sightings, I think, like, that's... A pretty credible statement because indeed in fact at the time the US did have like over 300 UFO sightings and to be honest there hasn't been too many sightings like since then so like it just makes it seem like but there was a lot of sightings during that time so it makes it seem more credible so this is the facts that we know 100% for sure about this incident the audit that was performed did support that, yes, the debris was from the Mughal project. There is indeed no, like, concrete evidence of, like, actual aliens, like, physical evidence that this indeed was an overreaction from the public. And that in the 1950s, the U.S. did indeed test parachute dummies. And these dummies were made out of flatex or plastic skin. That's what kind of gave them that alien yeah. appearance. There was a report upon the requesting of the files from Roswell incident. The Air Force Base, and this was during the crash of the in 1947, records from January through October 1947 were destroyed. So those records do not exist anymore. However, we do not know who, what person destroyed those records, and there was a like hundreds of witnesses of this crash event with the dummies. So they say like, so if it was really dummies, why are 
the dummies or aliens they found less than four feet. The dummies are usually six feet at this time. Well, maybe they had an uh, operator error when making the dummies. Maybe they made them too short accidentally, or maybe they were kind of making the test dummies like kid size, possibly. Just to actually like test the theory out, depending on what they were testing them against, of course. Which is outrageous to say, but they could have made the dummies four feet tall. Just because, like, sometimes when, like, stuff like that, if the test dummies are, sh like, smaller and shorter and all that stuff, they might be a little bit better for parachuting. But if they truly aren't dummies, then they probably made them the size of alien. Dun dun dun. <laughs> Why do you think the files were destroyed from the Roswell crash? Could the government be hiding something? Definitely. You only destroy records if you're hiding something. That's the only time. And this is the out there question. Do you believe in aliens? And if aliens existed, what do you think they would look like? I mean, I won't truly believe that aliens exist until one actually meets me face to face. But really, if you think about it, you know, whoever put the idea out there that aliens are green is kind of outrageous because I feel like aliens look probably just like us and they probably act like us and talk like us and all that stuff, but they probably have like small differences that we wouldn't notice, of course. Like internally, they may be like different with their system and all that stuff, but on the outside, they could look like us. They could, they could also, you know, shape shift. Yeah, they could also be simple like bacteria because technically sure. an alien by definition is life outside of Earth in like a different planet. So it could just be freaking bacteria. Sure though. Do you think it would be scary if other life did exist outside of Earth or if we found out that we are actually truly alone? Like, we're the only beings in the entire galaxy. I feel like it's not scarier if other life exists outside of Earth because, like, eventually Earth is going to come to an end and eventually our species is going to die out, sadly enough. So, like, to think about the fact that there's other life outside existing is actually kind of cool and you know like if we reach out to this other life and all that stuff we could when the time comes for our planet to die off could go to other planets of course and coexist with this other life yeah no it would be cool but also like at the same time we could truly be all alone in the universe we could be the only i don't life feel like that out there. is more scary it is because then it's like when it's our time for our planet to die out, we're all just gonna die and then life gonna just isn't gonna exist yeah. anymore. I would rather there other be life out there that we can coexist with because yeah. it would be great to keep our legacy going on as humans. But also humans are kinda shitty, so at the same time it's like eh. But in the comments below, we want to know what you think about Area 51. Is it just a top-secret military base like the government says it is? And that it doesn't have any extraterrestrial life? Or is the government still hiding something? So comment what you think below. But with that being said, thank you for listening to another episode of Murder's Mysteries and more. Remember to always keep your eyes open because you never know when the aliens are coming back for you.